You know, your phone is doing something right now that you're probably not even aware of. It's never really silent. It's constantly, well, shouting into the air. It's broadcasting things like, hey, I'm here. This is who I am. Is this my network? It's all part of its search for the best possible signal. But some people out there have gotten really, really good at listening in on that shouting. So today, we're going to pull back the curtain on a seriously powerful piece of surveillance tech that turns your phone's broadcast into a trap, the IMS eye catcher. All right, so here's how we're going to break this down. First, we'll talk about why your phone is always communicating. Then, we'll get into the nitty-gritty of how these digital traps actually work. After that, we'll look at some real-world uses, you know, separate the Hollywood stuff from the facts. We'll even explore the global industry that sells this tech, look at the big risks to our civil liberties, and finally, talk about what a path to responsible control might actually look like. Okay, so let's start with that first fundamental idea. It doesn't matter if you're walking down the street, sitting in a coffee shop, or even just at home on the couch. Your phone is on this constant, relentless hunt for the best cell signal it can find. And this isn't some setting you can just turn off in your menu. It's literally built into the DNA of how cellular networks operate. The best way to think about it is like this. Your phone is always scanning the horizon, right? It's looking for cell towers, and it's calling out, trying to find the one with the strongest signal. And to do that, to establish a connection, it has to announce certain unique identifiers. It's all automated, happening all the time, and it's what gives you that seamless service as you move from place to place. And this right here, this is the crucial question. The whole system is built on trust. The assumption that the cell towers your phone connects to are the real deal. But what if one of them isn't? What happens if the most powerful signal in your immediate area is actually coming from a device that isn't designed to give you service, but to listen in? Well, that's where things get really interesting and honestly, a little unsettling. So now we get to the core of it all, the technology itself. We're moving from the why to the how. What exactly is an ISI catcher? And how does it exploit your phone's normal, everyday behavior to create such a powerful surveillance tool? An IMS site catcher, sometimes called a cell site simulator, is pretty much a counterfeit cell tower. It's a piece of hardware, a piece of software, all designed to be just convincing enough that the phones around it get tricked into connecting. It doesn't have to be a perfect copy of a legitimate tower. It just has to play the part well enough for a few critical moments. So... Here's exactly how the trap is sprung, step by step. First, the operator flips a switch, and the device starts broadcasting a super strong signal. Now, your phone is programmed to be a signal junkie. It always wants the best connection. So when it sees this powerful new signal, it automatically connects. That's just default protocol. Sometimes the device will even force what's called a downgrade attack, making your phone connect over an older, less secure 2G protocol, which makes snooping way easier. And in that moment, that handshake, your phone announces its unique identifiers. The most important one here is the IMSI, the International Mobile Subscriber Identity. That's the unique number tied to your specific SIM card. The device then catches and logs that IMSI. Now, the IMSI itself isn't your name, but for law enforcement, it's the key. With a warrant, they can go to the carrier and say, tell us who owns this IMSI. Okay, so we've got the mechanics down. But how is this technology actually used out in the real world? It's so easy to picture some crazy Hollywood hacking scene, but the reality is often a lot more subtle, and in its own way, way more powerful. Let's walk through a totally realistic police scenario. Imagine investigators think a suspect is hiding out in a specific apartment building, but they have no idea which apartment. Instead of a huge, risky raid, they can just drive by and deploy a cell site simulator, quietly, invisibly. For just a few minutes, they power it on. Every phone in that building's radius connects. Now, they're not interested in everybody. They're looking for one specific MCI that they already know belongs to their target. And if that MCI pops up on their screen, bam, they've got a location lock. They've just confirmed their suspect is inside that building. And that one piece of information can be the break they need to crack the entire case. And this is where we have to separate the myth from the reality. Hollywood loves to show hackers listening in on encrypted WhatsApp calls in real time. But a modern IMSI catcher isn't really about breaking that kind of end-to-end -end encryption. No. Its true power is in presence detection and metadata. It's about answering incredibly critical questions like, who is in this building right now? Is my target at this location? And which other phones are gathering near my target? That kind of metadata is often more than enough to completely change the game for an investigation. So this technology didn't just appear out of thin air. It has a whole history, and understanding where it came from helps explain why it's such a hot-button issue today. Let's take a look at how IMC catchers went from being top-secret government tools to a full-on commercial industry. 
Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, as digital phones were becoming the norm, you started to hear rumors about these devices in security circles. For a long, long time, their existence was this kind of open secret that governments would just never officially admit to. But that all changed in the 2010s. Suddenly, you started seeing the term cell site simulators pop up in court documents. The cat was out of the bag. And that's really when the public debate over security versus privacy absolutely exploded. And make no mistake, this is a serious business. We're not talking about some cobbled together gadget built in a garage. Modern commercial IMC catcher systems are incredibly sophisticated pieces of technology, and they often cost well over 100,000 euros. They are marketed and sold to government agencies all over the planet. And this isn't just an American thing, not by a long shot. This market is global. You've got suppliers in Europe, Asia, the Middle East, you name it. And this really highlights the core of the problem. The technology has spread way faster than the laws to govern it. In some countries, sure, there's a clear legal process for using one. But in many, many others, they operate in this legal gray area with almost zero transparency or oversight. But all of this effectiveness, well, it comes with a massive, unavoidable side effect. Its very design creates this dilemma that sits right at the heart of the debate, and that is the huge risk it poses to all of our civil liberties. Okay, here is the fundamental problem. An IMSI catcher cannot just magically pick one single phone out of a crowd. In order to find the one IMSI it's looking for, it has to force every single phone within its range to connect and identify itself. It is, by its very nature, a form of mass sampling. You have to cast this huge digital net and scoop up data on everyone just to find that one person. And just think for a second about who else gets caught in that net. If a device is used at a political protest, it gathers the IMSIs of every single protester there. If it's used near a courthouse, it sweeps up data from lawyers, from journalists, from regular citizens. It logs the identity of every random person just walking down the street. Anyone and everyone inside that signal bubble becomes part of the data hall, whether they've done anything wrong or not. This quote, this quote just cuts right to the heart of the matter. The very same technology that can be an absolute game changer for fighting a dangerous kidnapper can, in the wrong hands or without proper rules, become a tool for tracking political dissidents. The capability is identical. The only thing that changes is the target. And that is the double-edged sword that we as a society have to figure out how to handle. So given this immense power and the huge potential for misuse, what's the answer? Banning the technology completely, well, that's probably not going to happen, given how useful it can be for law enforcement. So the conversation really has to shift to one about control, about oversight, and about accountability. You know, if we're going to accept the police will use advanced tools, then we have to demand advanced safeguards. Civil rights groups have a pretty clear framework. First, require a specific warrant before one of these things is ever turned on. Second, mandate regular, independent audits of the usage logs. Third, and this one is absolutely critical, enforce the immediate and automatic deletion of all data from innocent non-targets. And finally, implement delayed public reporting so we all know how and when these devices are being used without compromising active cases. At the end of the day, there's no magic button on your phone that can protect you from the lawful use of this technology by the government. The solution isn't a technical one, it's a civic one. The mature, responsible way to deal with the rise of these powerful surveillance tools isn't to just throw up our hands in paranoia. It's to demand transparency, to demand clear laws, and to demand real accountability from the people who use them. It's all about democratic control. So we end right back where we started. IMSI catchers are real. They are being used all over the world. The question isn't about whether they exist anymore, it's about how we govern them. As our world gets more and more saturated with sensors and surveillance, the real challenge for all of us is this. How do we build a framework of laws and ethics that gives us security without gutting the very freedoms that security is supposed to protect? That's the decision that simply can't wait.